wondering if was just my device or not.
smell like production monitoring, but can only be answered in production. And they're not all problems or anomalies, they're not all things that are going to just pop up um, on their own. Instead, they're about hypotheticals. They're about uh, specific customer segments, right? What, what happens if I, if I make this change in the code, if I um, you know, optimize this over here, will it actually produce the effect that I think it will? Um, often, this question is even just, what does normal mean? Right? Oh, okay, I, you know, this is what's happening, I want to make this a little bit better. Am I actually sure? Are we sure that this is what, what people are seeing? Um, or is this just what my test case is saying it should be? By being curious and empowered to leverage production data to explore what our services are doing, we can have that data not only inform what we're building um, or what we're fixing, but how to build those, how to scope those, um, how to, again, make sure it's working, um, and how to roll it out. So here are some you know, very traditional standard production systems ops and questions. Um, and it didn't take very much to turn them into things that, again, are production questions, are things that developers care about and think about, things that affect the business, uh, things that are relevant to our users. Again, answers to these only live in production. You're not going to be able to simulate these on your laptop uh, without going and looking what is happening, who's doing what, uh, at what rates. Our tests are only as good as the people who write them. And we're great, we just can't think of everything ahead of time. Uh, benchmarks can be a pain to run, um, and again, they're isolated. It's one particular thing you happen to think of. Um, acceptance aren't enough. Because sometimes, as much as we try, exceptional behavior doesn't always result in exceptions. Uh, so what can we do to extend these, these great practices that we have in development into production? Because um, we can't wait for ops folks to tell us that something went wrong. That's, that's you're depending on this external part of the development, the development cycle. And the customer knows uh, that we've missed an opportunity to be amazing. We've been, we've, you're, you're relying on them to be your QA, and that sucks for them and you. Um, so we should be taking the initiative to get the same amount of visibility into production as we do at development services. Let me tell you some stories and see how you feel. This is me. Um, she's a software engineer on a small team and has to wear many hats. She's been tasked to improve how her team implements rate limits. Uh, so until now, rate limits are just in process, cash, small startup, resource constraint, um, where each server is sort of trying to approximate the rate limit um, individually based on some global understanding of how many servers there are. Um, while this worked well enough, it's meant that as the team service grew, uh, there was this kind of uncomfortable correlation between, well, more of the customer's requests happen to go here because the load balancer was having an off day. Uh, you know, they're going to be rate limited more or, or less in some cases than they should. So it was, you know, came a point where it was time to split up a shared cache, clean up this tech debt. But instead of just making the change, um, B was like, okay, I want to be careful about changing what the customer sees. I can't just like come up with my hypothesis about what will happen, push the code, and kind of hope for the best. So she wants to know what data to gather to build confidence that this rate limiting algorithm uh, would work correctly and not screw over too many current customers. Uh, by bringing data into the decision making process, she could simulate the change uh, and see what the state, state behavior would be before flipping the switch and making their, her hypothesis real. Uh, so what, what we did, she did, uh, alongside the logic in her API server that calculated a particular rate limit for a request. She also added a bit that tracked whether it would be uh, whether it would be rate limited under the new algorithm. Um, and this let her basically visualize, hey, uh, this is what, what's currently happening. This is what would be happening in this brand new world. Code isn't actually shipped yet, but we're simulating this. Um, and you know, she'd see, cool, rate limiting algorithm actually works strict in a couple more places, but that's what it should be. That's what that's what that's what we expect. Uh, and she and her team were able to actually examine each case individually um, to assess, hey, this customer, this use case, is this what we expect to happen? Yeah, right? This is, this is again, these, like taking these test cases out of development, looking at them in production, but the where the test cases are actual users, actual workloads, actual machines. What's so special with iMachine anyway, right? Uh, that we can get so much more informative. This ability, 
Well, I mean, sorry. I mean, obviously, the ability to attach a debugger, spin up blog lines, do a bunch of stuff without screwing over actual customers. Um, but that's what we just did, right? That's what, that's what she was, that's how, how she got all the graphs in the previous slide. Uh, we she captured this metadata. These are our debug statements. They're lightweight. They help us validate these hypotheses. They carry metadata specific to the business, um, and they describe the execution of our, cert, of our logic in the wild. They sound a lot like things that we want out of a debug process. All right, so this is the leveled up. Uh, she's got her debug statements in the back pocket. She knows how to do that. Uh, she's ready to do a little bit more. Uh, now she's looking at the storage layer, and she's been working on some functionality to uh, basically change, uh, expand some, so it can be basically how, how she decides to lay out bits on disk. Details aren't important, sorry. Um, what she knows is she knows that it's something that will impact a small set of customers a lot, um, but shouldn't have a hugely visible impact on everyone else. But it's a very performance-sensitive private system. She doesn't want to just make a change without being sure about it. Um, and she wants to see what will happen, again, with the production workload on production machines. All the existing tests in the code gets passed, and new tests, again, that she wrote to verify correctness, it work as well. But earlier we talked about trans translating these debug statements to production. Is there an equivalent to tests and testing in production? Of course there is. Not that subtle of a speaker yet. You all know where this is going. Uh, the advantage of local tests, right, is this controlled state environment where you can construct and execute tests, but B can do the same in production by using things like feature flags. Uh, you can define a test segment, add that to your observability uh, solution of choice, um, and watch closely to see what happens. So she did. She rolled out her code behind her feature flag, turned on the new code for a couple customers, a couple machines. She was able to compare the same top level performance metrics that she normally cares about. Um, but able to directly compare the very small segment of folks uh, in the supply group, the control group. Um, and as confidence in the new storage layer increased, she was able to roll around 10% and 20% in the rest of the cluster, um, all while keeping a close eye on the performance metrics to see, hey, is, is everything kind of what we expect to see? These two graphs, uh, she could actually see a very, a very slight increase um, in latency as a result of the change. But it's expected, and it's within an acceptable threshold. And because, more than anything else, she could see and attribute that change to, okay, well, it's, it's, it's this set of, you know, this code executed with this set of customers versus everything else. She could feel confident that, oh, okay, yeah, this is, this is expected, this is correct, this is doing what I want. What she did here is similar to what a lot of us want to do. Uh, with canary, right? Canary, you associate with rolling a build out and single host, set, set hosts. But again, that's, that's thinking about things from an ops perspective. Um, and if we roll back and we think about, we want to think about things from a business perspective or, or a uniform board perspective, um, some customers are string heavy, some customers are int heavy, then the choice of single server is arbitrary and possibly kind of dangerous. Instead, feature flags are like a smarter manual canary that developers can control. And remembering and being able to incorporate them into our observability tooling gives us the ability to define these ephemeral segments in our code uh, to answer these ephemeral questions in a way that developers can, can work into their natural processes. Sometimes, though, even with the best intentions, uh, we manage to release code with bugs or unintended consequences. Um, the question that always comes up you know, knee-jerk reaction with things from a customer report, when did it start happening? Not necessarily because they're <laughs> super concerned about the, you know, the, the length of time it was live, although that was important too. Mostly because that's just the simplest way to that back to, hey, what commits, what pull requests, what new code was landed around this time? Uh, as any off person will tell you, okay, uh, biggest source of chaos in the system? Usually humans. Usually humans pushing code uh, new code, So B got tired of this uh, backwards timeline dance. I got religious about tagging her data with domains, identifiers, 
something that something that helped her to track kind of this code, when did this build, when did she cause these things on the graph. Um, and once she got that going, this highest single uh, highest signal piece of metadata available to the systems, um, she could immediately go from this to this. Something that, that goes from, hey, air volume kind of went up around this time, not really sure that we should go find out what happened, to, oh, okay, well, this building be something. Let's go track that down. By making her observability tools talk about her system uh, in terms that she dealt with, Day to day, she could go from you know this question mark, celebrate, and then be done part of the process to start filling in that middle section, to start thinking about testing and production, to thinking about investigating outliers herself, developer terms, um, not off terms, and to really start taking initiative and exploring production, <laughs> hopefully to find problems, identify things uh, before again your customers or us. That's how we bridge this ops and developer gap. That's how we start engineers like me start thinking about what happens after they ship. Instrumentation monitoring, not just things developers can throw in at the end of the, at, at the, end of the dev cycle after they've been like, okay, everything works, we're all free to go. They should be sprinkled in and continually checked, even as you're figuring out, hey, I think this is right, uh, but I want to test it, I want to see, I want to, I want to see the impact. And by capturing more lightweight, transient information of prod, um, before we able to switch and actually ship the code to everyone, we can make better informed decisions and deliver better experiences for our users. Now we can have this be part of our development process. Rather than just writing code, writing a plan, shipping it in isolation, um, actually forming hypotheses about what's happening in production um, and, and looking to see, hey, am I is the code I'm writing doing what I think it does? Plenty of us have had those experiences where we're like, hey, you know, I have this like, great idea for performance optimization. Um, benchmarks say it looks great. Let me actually run it. Doesn't do anything in production. Um, what if we could just cut out that like chunk of time where we spend a bunch of time writing code for nothing? What if we validate our processes and, and make sure we're doing the right thing? We're spending our time where it matters. All right, you're saying, great. This all sounds nice and wonderful. Um, how do we get there? What is, what is, what can we actually walk away with besides this high-level idealistic stuff? Well, uh, I think there's an instrumentation talk a little bit later. I suspect it will cover a lot of the same ground. Uh, but as we saw in the, I don't know if anyone's, how many of you were at the Prometheus Java talk earlier today, but there's a lot that can be, there's a lot that can be gained by just capturing something Right, every HTTP request, right? For every HTTP server, um, capturing a little bit of something about which endpoint, which method, which uh, how, how long the request took, you can start to capture a really high level view of what's happening. Uh, and this is even just great for things like, hey, who is even you know, would anyone will anyone care if we make this change for our API every year? Is anyone actually using it? Or is it just all all garbage? Um, how about this standard HTTP request that we start off with, uh, start sprinkling in some business relevant identifiers, right? These things that actually are descriptive of what the customer, oh, what your workflow, uh, what the workload looks like uh, at that point, um, as well as any infrastructure specific characteristics. Copy partitions, uh, you're reading from or writing to, database replica sets, all that, throw that in there because you know at some point you're going to be looking at, at something strange, you're going to want to break it down, and you're going to want to find out that it's that one replica set again is having problems. And those first two really set you up for the sort of ad hoc ephemeral queries that, that you saw in those two stories. Um, as you find yourself asking these questions, hey, I'm, I'm about to make this change, what does success look like there? Uh, you can find you can then find yourself uh, ready, set up to capture the information necessary to actually answer those questions before landing that thing. You had it with before, during, after of uh, this change, um, and I really understand how what you're, making, what you're doing affects these actual measures of health. And both of those examples we saw earlier, uh, the rate limiting example and the storage system example, relied on data that we had to add, uh, that, that was often added in parallel with the code being written, but 
it was so simple, like if you make it simple enough, you make it easy enough for your developers to add these things on the fly, the more they'll be empowered and able to pull that data and, and use that data. Uh, and you know, this is partly just clean up. Um, again, earlier when we did, we talked about uh, things like too many values, too many time series. Sometimes you got to clean things up, um, especially if you're generating lots of these, of these ephemeral attributes. Uh, some things that really keep, keep data easy to work with. Um, JPD, again, talked about Go contexts, a way to thread, hey, this thing's relevant to this request through your various microservices. Um, picking up basically whatever attributes you tag along the way that characterize something about this data. Um, a common set of nouns and consistent naming. I can't tell you how many, how many folks we've worked with who have ended up with um, a set of logs where in some parts, in some logs generated from some systems, they have app ID, some application ID, some app dash ID, um, help future you not hate past you. Um, and again, like in the end, look at what you need, look at what your developers need, look at what makes sense for your system, right? Uh, Say you have a service where you care a lot about re-performance, you care a lot about analyzing it, you're like, oh man, I really need to make sure everything is super optimized and and and, and uh turn all the issues there. Okay, well then like log as much as you can about shape read request for every single read request. Uh, so that you can go in later and, and slice and dice and like look at okay, re requests that have uh, this read requests that have these characteristics, how do they perform? What about these? What about this other segment? On the other hand, uh, you know, let's say this, this storage engine in the rain, uh, you have optimized the crap out of the right path. Uh, high throughput code path, um, really highly optimized, even, even in a case where your instrumentation library is super optimized or super low overhead, uh, you still probably want to be sensitive to performance. You still probably want to be careful about how you're logging things. I don't want to log something additional for every write that you process. So that's things up there. Um, Dogmatic, let the use case dictate where you're going. And again, this, this, this requires you know, folks deal with instrumentation to understand the use case and talking across that OS developer bridge. Um, and just because I always like to show folks what uh, this might look like in practice, um, this is uh, what Honeycomb's API schema <laughs> has evolved like. Uh, we started off, again, capturing these very simple, high level HTTP. Uh, parameters per, for each request. Um, and then we started adding things, we you know, started adding initial timers, we started adding some uh, you know, copper topic, copper partition, things like that. We started adding some things that were specific to uh, the routines that were being run, um, addition, again, like things that were actually being returned to the user in the API server, and we kind of just kept going. We kind of just kept, oh, uh, this is a big transition there. We kind of just kept adding more things, right? Pruning things that weren't useful, um, but we <coughs> wanted kind of to continue kind of building up this giant corpus of things that we could we could break that by, or we could measure, we could look at, uh, because the more the more we were, we you know, it's just this, this virtuous cycle of the more we knew, the more we wanted to know, the more the more we could build smarter, kind of, the right smarter code. Kind of. So, in conclusion, again. Don't care what tools you use, uh, so long as you're thinking about how you can be incorporating this sort of production data into your development process. Uh, if you're small, compliance, no compliance, whatever you do, uh, the folks who are involved in shipping software, building software, should understand the behavior of what their software does once they throw it over the wall or once they it. Uh, software developers should be owning observability because we have the most to gain. Uh, observability should be a core part of how we understand what to build and how to build it and who we're building it for. Uh, we should be coming up with lots of hypotheses about what, we, what, we're, what it should be doing, validating it before we're like, cool, done, that code was definitely worth writing. Um, we have the power to make our users happier by building better software. So by making our observability <laughs> tools reflect the software reality that developers live in, build like these feature flags, Customer IDs, like things, things that are not just posts and CPU and, and memory use. We can all be better engineers and we can all ship better software.
Uh, and by the way, all the stories that I told, they are real. Uh, you can find them at the this blog URL, um, and that's the URL for the little icon that I used. Thanks. Thank you. 